words of Ezekiel 38 are clear in defining Russia's control over Europe in the latter days. The group of nations that come against Israel are defined in Ezekiel 38, verse 2. Son of man, set thy face unto Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, according to Young's literal translation, the Prince of Rosh, the ancient name of Russia, described in antiquity as Rus, Meshach, identified by historians as the Muscovites who migrated north from the region of the Moscow Mountains between the Black and Caspian Seas, and Tubal, the region of Tobolsk, which historians identify as the destination of the migrating Tiberini. Gog is also of the land of Magog which is identified by historians as the area inhabited by the ancient Scythians and described by historians as spanning the region from the River Danube to the River Don, which we would know today as Central and Eastern Europe, the former Warsaw Pact area, or including much of it anyway. Gog is also in control of Gomer and his bands, whose tribes migrated across Europe and settled in the area of France. And these scriptures identify the influence Gog will have over this area. We read in verse 7, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now the idea expressed in this phrase, be thou prepared, is the niffle form of the word, describing its state of being, and defined by Gesenius as to be set up, to stand firm, to be established, and has the idea of being in a state of preparedness. The second part of the phrase, prepare for thyself, is the hithel form of the word, the causative action, the action that made the state possible, and is defined by Gesenius as to set up, to strengthen, to constitute, to appoint one as a king, to found, to direct one, or to aim a weapon, to apply the mind to something, to prepare and to make ready. So Gog is established in a state of preparedness because he has been actively strengthening himself, directing or aiming his weapons and applying his mind to prepare and make ready, both himself and the company that are to be assembled to him. This speaks of three tiers. There is an inner circle, the or Gog. There is a company which is assembled to him. And there is many people with thee of verse 6. The word assembled is the Hebrew word kahal, strong 6950, defining the assembled group either for religious or political reasons, or perhaps both. Gog is to be a guard unto them. This is the Hebrew word mishmar, strong's number 4929, defined by Gesenius as custody, a guard like a prison or a state of watch, that which is guarded, that which is observed, or a right or a law. And it comes from the root word shamar, meaning to keep or to have charge or to keep watch of, have ward or protection of. Now the nations that which are assembled and, and confederated with Gog are also under its charge, protection, or watch. They are its wards. This is the way the word was used in Nehemiah 4.22, where the guard kept the city safe. Now, we've seen this with the protection that Russia has given Syria and Iran, protecting it from Western interference, after Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan and others were brought under Western influence for a while. But this description is also applied to the rest of the nations of Europe. In their case, the use of the word appears to be more like the first use of it in Genesis 40, verse 3, when Joseph was put into the prison. This use of the word is a place of confinement. It's in keeping with the empire building of Babylon of times gone by, who was described as the oppressor in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 4, the one who weakened the nations in verse 12, who placed his burden on their shoulders, verse 25. And we read in verse 6, using the ESV, that struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows, that ruled the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. Now this is the destiny of Russia, to triumphantly bring Europe under its yoke, in effect chaining it. In fact, John Thomas wrote a booklet in 1860 entitled Anatolia, Russia Triumphant, Europe Chained to this effect. 
When the great empire of Daniel 2 is finally broken by the stone cut without hands and the various elements are broken in pieces together, verse 25, the scheme of bringing all the elements of the image together is the scheme of this prince of Rosh or Russia. He will use whatever levers he can pull to bring about his designs. Now, for the past 20 years, Vladimir Putin has been using Russia's oil and gas industry as a tool to improve Russia's standing on the world stage. In a 2014 booklet entitled Putin's Grand Strategy, contributors Starr and Cornell state the following. Over the past decade, if not since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian government has deployed a wide array of tactics and instruments in its efforts to restore a sphere of influence over the former Soviet space. The large-scale German-Russian trade has meant that German foreign policy has often been hostage to Russian interests." End quote. Well, not only this, but Russian gas has been weaponized and used as a tool to achieve Russia's strategic goals. The same writers continue. Russia's withholding of energy has been an important tactical tool in the Ukrainian conflict. But this was no innovation in 2014. Back in January 2006, explosions destroyed the electrical and natural gas transportation network through which Russia energy reached Georgia. Russian leaders blamed unidentified Northern Caucasus terrorists who were neither apprehended nor even much searched for, and the Russian authorities dragged their feet in repairing the damaged infrastructure. Between 2009 and 2011, moreover, Russia was implicated in a series of further bombings which rocked Georgia, including one targeting the perimeter of the U.S. Embassy in Tbilisi. In Turkmenistan in 2009, Gazprom abruptly abruptly closed off the flow of gas in the pipeline carrying Turkmen gas to Russia, causing the pipeline to explode. All these instances were connected directly with Russia's quest for control over a former Soviet republic. Well, seven years later on, we are seeing this policy bringing crushing results to all of Europe. The European Union is precariously dependent on imported gas to fuel its industry and heat its citizens' houses. According to Bloomberg... Outside supplies account for about 80% of the gas that the EU consumes, most of it coming from Russia, Norway, and Algeria. Some of the bloc's biggest economies are among the most exposed. Germany imports 90% of its needs. End quote. An energy crisis has arisen in Europe this fall. According to Bloomberg, Europe's heading into a winter facing an unprecedented energy squeeze and politicians are trying to figure out how to stop their citizens from freezing. The European Union's gas tanks are around 70% full. That is way below what's normal for this time of year and leaves members especially vulnerable if the winter is severe. Reuters reported on October 7th, the rocketing gas price, with the European benchmark up almost 600% this year, fueled by lower inventories and surging demand in Asia and elsewhere as economies recover from the COVID-19 crisis, has put Gazprom in Europe's crosshairs. Many are wondering if Russia is going to come to the rescue. Well, Russia began laying the $11 billion Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which bypasses Ukraine and travels under the sea to Germany in 2018. It was Germany's former prime minister, Schroeder, who advocated the Nord Stream's pipelines from Russia back in 2005. In the 2014 John Hopkins University report entitled Putin's Grand Strategy, we read, As Prime Minister Schroeder strongly advocated the Nord Stream Pipeline, a Russian project to deliver gas directly to Germany through the Baltic Sea instead of supplying gas across Eastern European countries. Shortly before the end of his term in 2005, Schroeder's government approved guarantees for 1 billion euros for the project. Three months after leaving office, he accepted a post as chairman of the Nord Stream Company. Ever since, Schroeder has been a reliable spokesman for the Kremlin. End quote. 
Well, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was initially put on hold in January 2015 due to sanctions against Russia following its annexation of Crimea. In 2018, Germany granted a permit for construction in German waters. Then back in 2018, Donald Trump warned of the dangerous journey Germany was taking, putting itself in Russia's control. The UK publication Montel reported on July 13, 2018, I think it's a horrible thing that Germany has done. Trump told reporters at a joint press conference with Theresa May at the UK Prime Minister's country residence, Checkers. He said the gas pipeline would mean that Germany will get 60 to 70 percent of its energy from Russia. How can you be working for peace and working from strength when someone has that kind of power over your company, Trump said. I think it's very bad for Germany, very bad for the German people, end quote. Well, Trump placed sanctions on any company working with Nord Stream 2 to prevent Russia's grip on Europe. Joe Biden removed the sanctions from companies involved in the Nord Stream 2 project, effectively giving the green light to complete it, as CNBC reported. The Obama and Trump administrations galvanized bipartisan opinion against the pipeline, and President Joe Biden, too, announced sanctions against companies involved in the project, But these were waived in May in what was seen as an attempt by the U.S. to rebuild its ties with Germany. End quote. Well, Putin held a televised meeting on Wednesday, October 6, offering to graciously solve the problem that is currently facing Europe, but blaming the EU for that problem. Another factor is the practice of our European partners. This practice has once again confirmed that, in fact, they made mistakes. We talked to the European Commission's previous lineup, and all its activity was aimed at phasing out of so-called long-term contracts. It was aimed at transition to spot gas trade. And as it turned out, it has become obvious today that this practice is a mistake. What Putin is referring to is the practice of European nations of phasing out long-term gas contracts for short-term contracts called spot deals. The plan was to enable European nations to replace gas supplies with renewable energy, but it has backfired incredibly. So the question is, is Russia coming to the rescue or is it taking Europe hostage? Well, Russia has maintained all its contracts, but has refused to open the spot market and fill the demand. Russia is claiming it has increased its supply by 15%, as Andrei Keelan, Russia's ambassador to the United Kingdom, stated in an interview with the BBC. Gazprom has increased its supply by 15% uh, to Europe in recent days. This is uh, quite a high amount, I would say, because you have to pump it very quickly. Russia is claiming it cannot send any more through the Ukraine as the pipeline is becoming dangerous to operate. Ambassador Keelan went on to state, uh, We have increased uh, supplies via uh, Ukraine pipeline uh, by 10%, but as we understand, we cannot do more because uh, the uh, equipment at this pipeline has never been uh, uh, modernized and has never been reconstructed, so it is simply dangerous to use it. And Russia is holding back gas supplies until the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is approved for use, as Ambassador Keelan also confirmed. What is absolutely a fact of life is that uh, the pipeline Nord Stream 2 is, does exist. It is ready. It is prepared for use. And we expect uh, a final uh, go ahead from, from Germany. So as soon as it will be it's, uh, happen, then, of course, uh, new gas supplies will come uh, from this pipeline, which is shorter for 2,000 kilometers, which provides much cleaner uh, gas because it is new and modern equipment and the pipeline itself is very new and modern. It it is definitely cheaper than the gas which is going on right right now. Putin's 20-year plan is coming to fruition. Germany and Europe are being forced into an agreement that will give Russia a chokehold over Europe. Germany meets on Thursday to decide about Nord Stream 2 pipeline. CNBC published an article on October 7th entitled, The U.S. Was Right. Europe has become a hostage to Russia over energy, analysts warn. They couldn't bring themselves to say, 
Trump was right, but the point is made. And the article stated, Europe has now left itself hostage to Russia over energy supplies, said Timothy Ash, energy market senior sovereign strategist at Blue Bay Asset Management in Research Note Wednesday, calling the situation unbelievable. It's crystal clear that Russia has Europe in an energy headlock and Europe is too weak to call it out and do anything about it, he said, calling it a form of energy blackmail. Europe is cowering at the fears that as it heads into winter, Russia will further turn the screws of the energy pipeline off and allow it to freeze until it gets its way with Nord Stream 2 pipeline certification, end quote. So Russia has weaponized its gas monopoly to bring Europe under its yoke. Without firing a bullet, it has chained Europe through its energy policy. The picture painted by Daniel and Ezekiel are coming into fruition. But there are more forces at play than just man's machinations. Remember the account of the disciples in the storm when Christ was sleeping in the boat? Notice carefully the words of Luke chapter 8, verses 24 to 25. They went and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying one to another, Who then is this that he commands every, even the wind and the water, and they obey him? End quote. Well, the fact is the Lord is in control of the winds and the water, and that is not lost on us when we consider the crisis gripping Europe right now and playing into Russia's hands. The European Union has been legislating a move to renewable energy, such as wind and solar power, over the past 20 years. Renewable energy cannot be stored the same way oil and gas can. Not only this, but it is a source of energy reliant on the weather. As a Daily Mail article pointed out this week, a focus on renewables and developing better connectivity with neighbours such as Norway to enable the UK to import gas effectively meant little new storage has been built. The article went on to state, so far renewables have not made up the gap, especially in recent months when the wind has not been blowing, end quote. Well, another article in Fortune magazine entitled The UK Went All In on Wind Power, Here's What Happens When the Wind Stops Blowing, describes the situation that developed this summer. The exponential growth of offshore wind farms in the North Sea has been a testament to the combined efforts of the European countries investing time, effort and money into the decarbonization of their electricity grids. But just as Europe needs energy the most the wind in the North Sea has stopped blowing, forcing regional energy markets to scramble for gas reserves to heat homes and power businesses. This has had expensive consequences. As the European energy market grows increasingly reliant on renewable energy source that is cheap to harness and carbon emission free, but is clearly unreliable when the wind isn't blowing, surging electricity bills are an unintended consequence of the energy transition. Heading into winter at a time when more energy is already needed to fuel economic recovery as the region emerges from the pandemic, European countries are setting aside quotas meant to cap carbon emissions and rethinking the shutdown of coal plants in order to fulfill the gap left by the missing wind. The situation is especially acute in the UK, where wind currently provides only 7% of the country's energy makeup, a steep drop from 25% it generated on average across 2020. End quote. The drop in wind is not the only contributor to the crisis. In a program on CNBC this past week entitled Why Natural Gas is So Expensive, Sam Meredith, an energy correspondent for CNBC, reported on other natural phenomena which have been contributing.
The move to renewable energy sources intended to move away from dependence on fossil fuels has brought Europe into a crisis and brought it more desperately dependent on Russia's gas supplies. In his interview with the BBC, Russian ambassador to the UK, Andrei Keelan, stated... We do believe that mechanism that has been uh, approved and promoted by the European Commission of Sport Market is uh, wrong. Uh, it, should, uh, it, it has demonstrated since uh, the wind was low, uh, speed of wind was low uh, during this time, and there is no possibility to store uh, solar uh, energy from solar panel and ventilators. Uh, this will be the, it is always will be a difficulty. CNBC also reported energy giant SSE said its renewable assets produced 32% less power than expected between September between April 1st and September 22nd thanks to historically dry and low wind conditions. This equates to 11% of its full year output target. This shortfall was driven by unfavorable weather conditions over the summer, which was one of the least windy across most of the UK and Ireland, and one of the driest in SSE's hydro catchment areas in the past 70 years, the Perth, Scotland-based company said Wednesday in a statement. Low wind output over the summer has contributed to the European energy crunch and sent the power prices to record highs in recent days. Other factors include a cold and unexpected winter last year, production cuts during the pandemic, low imports from Russia, high carbon prices, and growing demand for, from Asia for liquefied natural gas. In August, Germany utility RWE reported much lower wind volume across its northern and central European portfolio for the first half of 2021. End quote. While seeing the Lord controls the winds, it's amazing to see this crisis pushing Europe into a greater dependence on Russia and playing into its hands. And let's not forget, Israel just happens to have recently discovered a massive supply of natural gas. On October 21st, Reuters reported Israel is considering the construction of a new onshore pipeline to Egypt in order to quickly boost natural gas exports to its neighbor in the wake of the recently tightening global supplies, the Israeli energy minister said. Back in January of 2020, the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies published an article entitled The Leviathan Natural Gas Field Could Be a Game Changer for Israel-EU Relations. While we don't expect this to be the case from a biblical perspective, it is interesting to note what it said. Israeli natural gas offers the EU a rare opportunity to loosen Russia's energy chokehold on parts of Europe. Moscow wields access to energy supplies as a political weapon. The Levantine Basin offers the EU an alternative, a reliable and price competitive source of liquefied natural gas, end quote. Well, all the more reason for Russia to set its sights on Israel in the coming years. Remember that the time of Russia's turning back has passed. The Soviet empire that imploded in 1991 was turned back and floundered for years. Russia is now being to, beginning to be prepared, making preparations and being drawn forth for the great conflagration of the end of days. As we read in Ezekiel 38 verse 4, I will turn thee back. And I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth. And all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Well, while we see the grip of Russia extending over Europe, and the nations of Europe yielding themselves as its servants, being brought under its control, we need to think long and hard about who our master is. As we read in Romans 6, verses 16 to 18, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness." And so as we stand on the very knife edge of the kingdom, as we see the nations moving and all the forces at play, both angelic and the the plans of man, 
we can see how that God is bringing these events to their great culmination. For the Bible in the News, this has been Jonathan Bowen joining you.